Time is more valuable than money. You can get more money, but you cannot get more time. Time is our most valuable asset, and of course, you wouldn't want someone to take your money or seed corn. You also shouldn't let anyone waste your time. Time is precious, and it's important to protect it, just like you would protect your capital. When should you begin your day? You start as soon as you finish planning it. Map out your day meticulously, allowing for flexibility to accommodate surprises and unforeseen events. Yet, if you've crafted a solid plan for a productive day, that's when you kickstart your activities. You'll be amazed at how much more valuable your time becomes. Don't commence the day until you've completed its blueprint. Likewise, don't start the week until you've finished planning it. Laying out a week is a pretty good challenge. Next, don't start the month until you have it finished. The places to go, the people to see, the productivity, the sales, the customers, the development, and all the rest of what you want to accomplish during the course of 30 days. Don't start the month until it's finished. While you may not be able to plan every minute, ensure you have a clear vision of what you aim to achieve throughout the year. But come January 1st, things may deviate from your plans. You might even exceed your expectations and make significant progress in the first 90 days. This happened to me once. I thought, wow, here's how this is going to be a great year. But by the time I finish the third month, I'm rolling, I'm soaring, and so many things are happening. I revised my whole year's plan. It's amazing how things can change for the better when you start planning. Life is not just the passing of time. Life is a collection of experiences, their frequency, and their intensity. Life is not just watching the clock tick away. Life is a collection of experiences, their intensity, and their frequency. When my friend Mark died at age 44, someone said, that's young to die. But what if you lived four lifetimes in one? It might not be too young, whatever the span of your life turns out to be. So here's what you want to fill it up with. Experiences and the intensity of those experiences. My father lived for 93 years, which might sound like a long time, but it felt short. Even though you lived to the age of 93, it still felt short because we always wish we had more time with our loved ones. In ancient times, according to stories in the Old Testament, some people lived for hundreds of years, like 500, 600, 700, even 800 or 900 years. If I had the chance, I'd ask, how come we got short change? It's an interesting question, don't you think? Just imagine having 700, 800, or 900 years to see your family grow and thrive through generation after generation. Now, I mean, you've got to be healthy to make it to 900. So no matter how long or short your life may turn out to be, it's important to focus on filling it with meaningful experiences and making those experiences intense and fulfilling. Becoming a master at time management will allow you to design and improve every aspect of your life. Managing your time meticulously is easier said than done, but just like anything great you will ever accomplish, the hardest step is to begin. Try not to just read through these steps, but to put them into action. Now let me share some tips on managing your time effectively. If you don't design your own life plan, chances are you'll fall into someone else's plan. Designing your life is a nice way of saying, don't let life happen to you. Make your life happen. A ship that leaves its dock without a planned destination will wander the seas aimlessly, and guess what? It will never get to where it was meant to be. Every day is an accumulation of time. Therefore, managing your time is managing your day. This will lead to having your life planned out day by day until you realize you have achieved most, if not all, of your goals. Think on paper. Write down your goals and dreams. This might be a document app or the old-fashioned pen to paper, but this is not an option. There is something special that happens when we jot down our goals because the mind begins to see them as actionable steps, not just dreams. Most people say they want to be successful and dream about being great, but have never written out the steps to get there. Meticulously plan and schedule your life in real time on paper. This will lead to the next step, which is planning out how you will achieve your goals. When you don't control your time, your time will control you. Have you ever experienced a day in which you did not plan out your time and before you knew it, you had gotten nothing done? This is how most people's lives go by. They have no specific plan for their time and therefore for their lives. Your choices determine the person you end up being. See every moment as an opportunity to savor the time and make the most of it. If you control how you spend your time, you can control your successes and failures. Days are expensive. When you spend a day, you have one less day to spend. So make sure you spend each one wisely. If it's easy to do, it's easy not to do. 
We kid ourselves. Ah, that's simple. Why should I plan it out? I'll just do it. This has proven not to work time and time again. Simply because if it's easy to do, it is easy not to do. We are a product of the things we continuously do. Without a sense of urgency, desire loses value. If you don't plan out your time, you are not putting a timeline on your goals. Having deadlines creates a sense of urgency. This is why we start to work on a month-long project around the last week to the deadline. The pressure makes it seem dire and will act as a type of motivator to completing and accomplishing our goals. Study the art of setting goals. Every day, write your goals fresh without focusing on yesterday. This is a good way to weed out non-priorities and refocus on your true goals. Focus is something lacking in today's society. Don't fall victim to this. So review your goals on a daily basis to reinforce them and make realizing them practical. Derek Mills suggests a daily standard system where we don't necessarily work towards a long-time goal but focus on daily goals, which eventually turn into long-term successes. Also, remember to regularly review your goals. Take some time to go over your goals and ensure that your list is still motivating you and keeping you excited. If someone asks you why you're up so early, you can tell them, if you were going to meet who I'm going to meet, you'd be up early. If you were headed where I'm headed, you'd be up early too. It's all about setting yourself up for success and making sure that you're ready to take on whatever challenges or opportunities come your way. We all have the same amount of time in a day. Start where you are. It doesn't matter where you are now. 90% of millionaires started out broke. The key to success is taking a lot of action on a great idea. And the only way to do this is to manage your time. Plan around every single action, no matter how simple. You can turn your life around at any given moment. The best way to do this is by time management. Start simple by having a notebook where you write down how you spend every hour of your time. If you surf the web for two hours, write it down. If it takes you 30 minutes to stalk your favorite celebrity, write it down. Everything you do for one week, write it down. In the end, you will see where most of your time goes. You will also start to resent having to write down that you spent one hour looking at pictures of a car you could only afford if you actually used that time wisely. This is a great place to start. From there, you can follow the many time management tips available to you and see what works best for you. Ignore the whole idea of time management. Sometimes it's okay to let go of worrying too much about time. You don't have to stress over managing every minute of your day. If you feel overwhelmed by the idea of controlling your time, Remember that you have the choice to let go of that pressure. You don't have to feel obligated to micromanage every aspect of your time if it doesn't serve you well. Sometimes it's better to take a step back and do something simpler. Let's consider an individual working in sales. They may harbor aspirations of owning their own company one day. Eventually, they achieve this dream and ascend to the position of boss. However, they soon realize they have scant time for activities they once relished, such as playing golf. Reflecting on their past, they reminisce about how during their sales days, they could earn well and still enjoy golf three times a week. This prompts a pivotal decision. Recognizing the demanding nature of managing a company and longing for control over their schedule, they opt to return to their former sales role. The crux lies in recognizing when things become overwhelming. If stress mounts, it may be prudent to transition to a role with less time pressure. Remember my earlier caution about certain pursuits costing too much. Hence, contemplate stepping down to something less demanding. The next key to time management is the idea of working longer and harder. I almost lost my health the first year I went so crazy about personal development and achievement. I just went bonkers, you know? I told you I was skinny, but by the end of that first year, I was a walking shadow. And then it suddenly occurred to me, what if I got rich and too ill to spend it? I mean, that was a shocker. So I started developing a little more reasonably because I said, if 12 hours won't do it, I'll work 14. If that won't do it, I'll work 18. I mean, how many hours does it take? And sure enough, it cost me too much. So working longer and harder for some might be appropriate. If you're just sitting around not doing that much, this might be good. Work longer and harder, but you can only work so hard. Here's the key. Not to work harder, but smarter. When you've worked as hard as you can, doing the best you can in terms of physical output in a reasonable time. Now, here's the ultimate in the management of time. You simply become more skillful. When I first got into sales, you know, I was around people that could get 9 out of 10, 8 out of 10. And when I first started, I could only get 1 out of 10. 
But here's what I did. I worked around the clock. I made up in numbers what I lacked in skill. That's good in sales. You got to jot that down. When you're new, you make up in numbers what you like in skill. Now, when you become more skillful, the numbers can go down. Because now, your persuasive ability and all of that is so high that you don't need to put as many numbers out. But at first, if you want to compete or if you want to really get good, you've got to put in the numbers. But if you get more from yourself, develop more of yourself, now the time management becomes an easier task. In time management, one of the most important skills to develop is the ability to distinguish between what we call majors and minors. When you answer the phone, ask yourself, is this conversation about something major or minor? If it's minor, you can exchange a few pleasantries and then move on. But if it's major, you might need to take some notes to remember the important points discussed. When you're about to have an important conversation, just jot down a little agenda. It's easy to just talk out of your head, but that can lead to confusion and inefficiency. Have you ever been in a conversation where someone couldn't remember what they wanted to discuss? It can make you look unprepared and unsued. By creating an agenda before the call, you'll have a clear outline of the topics you need to cover. This can be incredibly helpful, especially later on when you need to recall what was discussed. For example, let's say you call Peter from the sales department and mention four specific things during the conversation. Later, if Peter claims that you didn't talk about those topics, you can refer back to your agenda to jog his memory. This way, you have evidence of what was discussed, which can be especially important when dealing with salespeople who might try to convince you otherwise. Remember, if you don't have some form of documentation, important details can easily slip through the cracks. So always make an agenda before making a call to ensure clarity and productivity. Now, what's major? What's minor? Here's the key. Don't major in minor things. If you focus too much on minor tasks, you'll always be playing catch up. In sales training, they teach us about major and minor tasks. Minor tasks include things like making lists, keeping records, visiting potential customers, and evaluating how things went after visiting a customer. These tasks might seem important, but they're actually minor because they don't directly involve interacting with the customer. Here's major time, in the presence of the prospect. That's major time. That's when you're in the presence of the customer, and it's the most important time for a salesperson. And if you took a look, if you're in sales and you took a look at a week, you'd say, my gosh, I'm spending 90% of my time on the minor stuff and so little time on the major stuff. In the presence of how many hours in the presence of in my day? How many hours in the presence of during my sales week? Because the time that really counts is in the presence of majors and minors. So it's essential to evaluate how much time you're spending in the presence of customers each day or week. That's the time that really counts and has the most significant impact on your success in sales. Another important aspect of time management is knowing when to say no. In today's society where being social is highly valued, it's easy to fall into the trap of saying yes to everything. But saying yes too often can lead to feeling overwhelmed with responsibilities. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you said yes to something too quickly, only to realize later that you're overloaded with tasks? Then you have to spend even more time trying to back out of commitments you shouldn't have made in the first place. It's a hassle, isn't it? Instead of saying an immediate yes, it might be better to respond with something like, I don't think I can do that right now, but if anything changes, I'll let you know. This way, you're not committing yourself right away and you give yourself some time to consider whether you can realistically take on the task. One of my friends said, don't let your mouth overload your back. It's a reminder to be mindful of how much you agree to take on so you don't end up burdening yourself with more than you can handle. Concentration is another important aspect of time management. I learned this lesson many years ago through a memorable experience. I was in the shower trying to compose a letter in my head. However, I found that the letter turned out quite strange because my mind was wandering. So here's what I learned to do. Save your work for when you're actually at your desk in the office. Don't try to tackle work tasks while you're on your way to work. Instead, focus on enjoying the journey to work. For example, if you're in the shower, fully immerse yourself in the experience of taking a shower. Then, when you arrive at the office, you can concentrate better because you're not trying to multitask or split your focus between different activities. I found that practicing concentration is incredibly helpful. Once you're at work, it allows you to give your full attention to the task at hand, which ultimately leads to greater productivity and better results.
One of the most important ones is, don't play at work. When you play, play. When you work, work. Don't mix the two, because work is too serious. I learned this lesson the hard way. There was a time when I used to take my family to the beach, but I would bring my briefcase along, thinking I could get some work done while we were there. However, I quickly realized that this wasn't a good idea. Instead of enjoying our family time together, I was preoccupied with thoughts about work, and my family could sense my distraction, which affected their enjoyment too. Similarly, when I was at the office, I would often find myself daydreaming about being at the beach with my family. As a result, my productivity suffered because I wasn't fully focused on my work. So I learned to be more present in each moment. At the beach, be at the beach and enjoy the time with my family, and when I'm at the office, concentrate on my work without letting thoughts of leisure activities distract me. By separating work and play and giving each its dedicated time and attention, I found that I can be more productive and enjoy my leisure time more fully. So when you work, work. When you play, play. Don't mix the two. Don't work at play. Another important thing to remember is that every job is valuable. Even if you might not find your current job particularly appealing, but if it serves as stepping stones toward your desired destination, it's important to value it. You don't necessarily need to have a passion for your job. The ultimate passion lies in striving for remarkable success in every facet of life. That's the true passion. So don't disparage any seemingly mundane job you undertake as part of your journey toward your goals. No job is insignificant. Every job holds dignity, exchanging time for remuneration, contributing to the fabric of society. Here's the next key for managing your time. Don't mistake movement for achievement. It's common to feel like you've accomplished a lot just because you've been buoy all day. For example, someone might come home in the evening feeling exhausted and say, I've been busy all day long. But the important question to ask is, busy doing what? It's not enough to just keep moving from one task to another. Some people might seem like they're constantly busy, but they're not actually making much progress. It's like running around in circles. You're moving, but you're not really getting anywhere. It's essential not to mistake busyness for achievement. Instead of focusing solely on staying busy, focus on accomplishing meaningful tasks that move you closer to your goals. That way, you'll ensure that your efforts are leading to real progress and not just keeping you occupied. Pay attention to anything that might be taking away your time. It's important to remember that time is valuable, just like money. You wouldn't let someone steal your savings or investments, right? Similarly, you shouldn't allow anyone to steal your time. You need to be deliberate about how you allocate your time, and there are certain serious times that you simply can't afford to let anyone interrupt. It's okay to let people interrupt during less important or casual moments, but when it comes to serious tasks or designated time for important activities, you need to protect that time and not allow anyone to steal it away from you. Evaluate your current state, including any weaknesses you may identify. If it appears that you're unable to rectify those weaknesses, here's the solution. Find a way to compensate for them. I used to repeatedly promise myself that I would handle the bookkeeping, but eventually, I abandoned that notion. Back then, it only cost me an additional $50 or $60 a month for an accountant to manage the books, yet I hesitated, thinking, no, I'll save the $50. You wouldn't believe the decline in productivity I experienced just to save that amount. So the key takeaway is, often you may remain as you are, but ensure you address any shortcomings adequately. It might cost you a little extra money or effort, but in the long run, it can save you a lot of time and stress. The ultimate strategy for effective time management is to enhance your skill level in your field. When I first entered the sales profession, my colleagues boasted impressive success rates, closing 9 out of 10 sales, while I struggled to secure even 1 out of 10. Initially, to compensate for my lack of expertise, I committed myself to relentless hard work, focusing on quantity over quality. This underscores a crucial lesson in sales. When you're new to a domain, you can offset your skill deficit by amplifying your efforts and expanding your outreach. Initially, it's about maximizing quantity. However, as you gain proficiency and experience, your success rate naturally ascends, alleviating the need for exhaustive exertion. Your capacity to persuade and influence others burgeons, enabling you to be more discerning in your endeavors. Yet attaining such mastery demands unwavering dedication and diligence, particularly in the nascent stages. Once you've honed your skills and attained competence, effective time management becomes more streamlined, 
as you accomplish more with less effort. In conclusion, effective time management is not merely about micromanaging every minute of the day, but rather about recognizing when to assert control and when to let go. It involves prioritizing tasks, compensating for weaknesses, and continuously striving for improvement. By valuing every job, regardless of its perceived significance, and by focusing on enhancing skills and proficiency, one can navigate through challenges and achieve greater success. Ultimately, effective time management empowers individuals to make the most of their time, enabling them to accomplish their goals and lead fulfilling lives. Turning wisdom from your philosophy and inspiration into the strengthening of attitude, faith, courage, commitment, and all the stuff that comes from attitude. If you're willing to take these two qualities, philosophy and attitude, and invest them into activity, you can have a miracle. Anything short of that, no miracle. Wisdom doesn't perform a miracle. Attitude doesn't perform a miracle. The only thing that performs a miracle of increase, called equity, is putting wisdom and attitude into discipline, into labor. And this labor now can perform a miracle. Take action, not hasty if it isn't required, but don't lose much time. Here's the time to act. When the idea is hot and the emotion is strong, that's the time to act. You see, if you're saying, I'd like to have a library like yours, if you feel strong about that, what you've got to do is get the first book, and then get the second book before the feeling passes, and before the idea gets dim. Action pronto, action immediate action as soon as possible. Because if you don't, here's what happens. We call it the law of diminishing intent. We intend to when the idea strikes us, we intend to when the emotion is high. But now, if you don't translate that into action fairly soon, now the intent starts to diminish, diminish, diminish. And a month from now it's cold, a year from now it can't be found. So act, set up a discipline when the emotions are high and the idea is strong and clear and powerful. That's the time to set up the discipline. And somebody talks about good health and you're stirred, says right, I need to get a book on nutrition. Get the book before the idea passes and before the emotion gets cold. Go for the book, start the library, start the process. Fall on the floor, do some push-ups. Action, got to take action, otherwise the wisdom is wasted. Otherwise the emotion soon passes, unless you put it into disciplined activity. Capture it. Discipline is called how to capture the emotion and how to capture the wisdom and translate it into equity. Discipline, here's the two parts to the labor. One, do what you can. Number two, do the best you can. Can't give you better advice than that. Number one, do what you can. You just got to go home and make a list after today. And here's the question to ask as you make this personal list. What am I not doing that would be easy to do? That could greatly change my health, my wealth. What am I neglecting that would be easy to do? Just go home and answer that question personally. You don't have to put the answers on a public bulletin board. This is just all personal stuff. Errors in judgment, disaster, few simple disciplines. Wealth beyond imagination. And if you'll pick up the activity part, the miracle working part, plant the seed part, take care of your part. The soil will take care of its part. The seed will take care of its part. The seasons will take care of their part. The miracle will take care of its part. If you'll take care of your part, called putting it into activity, action works miracles. If you handed a problem to a miracle worker, what would he be inclined to say? No problem. You've got to hang out with folks like that. I belong to a small group like that. We do business around the world. You hand these guys a problem, they say, no problem. How many books would they read to solve it? As many as it takes. How early would they get up? Early as it takes. How much information would they gather? As much as needed. So it's what? No problem. You've got to hang out with folks like that. But here's the real problem. If you should fish, and you could fish, and you don't fish, you've got no miracle. You could change, you should change, you won't change. But that's called accumulated disaster. In six years, you'll be explaining instead of celebrating, having some ragged list like I had. Reasons for not doing well, pennies in my pocket, could should don't disaster. And if you'll just start the process of change, could should and will, you can start this whole process. And if you will then put it into action, the miracle belongs to you. But here's how you get a miracle going for your life. Number one, do what you can. Get a list of the stuff you could do and you haven't done, postponed, and start cleaning that up. And you can't start at a better place for personal change that'll affect your bank account, affect your future, affect your income, affect everything. 
You can't start a better life change process than cleaning up what you should be doing. The man says, well, my mother lives down in Florida. Should have written her six months ago. I just can't seem to get that letter written. I'm asking you to get that letter written, clean it up. And don't walk like other people walk. Don't postpone like other people postpone. You say, well, is it as simple as writing a letter? And the answer is yes. Where else would you start for life change, personal change? You don't need a pink package to fall out of the sky. You don't need massive bombardment of the conscious and subconscious, practice, channeling, find a 2000 year goal, guru. I mean, you don't need any of that stuff. Pass on all that, and kids are afraid of that stuff. Too much of it, you'll be out on a limb with Shirley. I mean, pass on all that stuff. The stuff's too easy, the stuff's too simple. It's called taking action. Number one, unneglect, unerrors in discipline. Two, start setting up some disciplines. And if you'll do that, you'll perform a miracle. Now, here's the second part of the miracle. Number one is, do what you can. Here's number two, do the best you can. If that's not your philosophy, I would ask you to amend it. Let me give you the best of ancient script. Here's what it says. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might, do it with all your strength, and do it with all your power. What a good philosophy, that kind of philosophy revolutionizes your life. If you haven't picked it up lately, a guy slips in late, company doesn't seem to mind, slips out early, first one in the parking lot heading for happy hour, stretches his break, comes early for lunch, laid back for lunch, company doesn't seem to notice. Guy says, best as I can calculate, I'm putting in about half a day's work, and I'm collecting a full day's pay. And the guy says, I got it made. Little does he know, the seeds of his own disaster are already being sown by the weakness of his own personal philosophy. It's not the economy that's going to determine your next six years. It's your philosophy about labor and about activity and about miracle and soil and seed and sunshine and rain and the economy and the banks and the money and the companies and the schools and what's going on. It's your philosophy and your attitude and then your ability to take action. All of that we call the process of life change, miracle working. 1. Do what you can. 2. Do the best you can. What are the results at the end of the day? The results at the end of the week? You can't let too much time go by without checking. When time goes by six years, I've been out there working. When I met my teacher, Mr. Schatz, Schatz said, Well, Mr. Rowe, let's just go through a little summary here. He said, in the last six years, how much money have you saved and invested? Let's go through a little tab list here. How much money have you saved and invested? The last six years, I said, what? Zero. He said, you have messed up. Who sold you on that plan? I thought, my gosh, the man's right. I'm a nice guy. I bought the wrong plan. What if you were 50 and broke, right? Didn't need to change countries, bought the wrong plan. What a sad scenario that would be. But shots upset these questions. Let's go through some results. He said, how many books have you read in the last 90 days? I said, zero. Wisdom of the world available. Change your life, change your future. Wisdom of the world available. Develop any skill you want. Earn the kind of income you want. Have all the treasures you want. Equities you want. Relationship with your family that you want. Everything that you want, available. And the wisdom of the world to help you get it. Haven't read any books in the last 90 days. My teacher said, yeah, Mr. Rowe, you have messed up. I'm telling you, you got the deal. Show off. Said, Mr. Rowe, in the last six months, how many classes have you taken to improve your skills or to develop new skills? Go for the American dream. Become rich and powerful and sophisticated and healthy and influential. How many classes have you taken the last six months? I said, how many? Zero. He said, you have messed up. Said, you don't need to unmess the country. You don't need to straighten out the perplex. You don't need to straighten out any of this stuff. All you've got to do is look within and let results teach you a great deal about your own activity, your own attitude, and your own philosophy. I went through that process. Take this phrase home. Results is the name of the game. What other game is there? Your results. Here's all life asks us to do. Make measurable progress in reasonable time. Just take home that little phrase. Good phrase. We're asked in life simply to make measurable progress in reasonable time. We demand it of our children. How many years do you want your child to spend in fourth grade? Approximately about one. If it looks like they're not going to make it, we pour on the pressure, call legitimate pressure. 
Lack of results, peer pressure, family pressure, school pressure, community pressure, every other kind of pressure we can bring to bear. Why? You can't stay more than one year in fourth grade. As parents, you'd have to leave the community and say, well, what if they're nice kids? Wouldn't you give them three or four years? The answer is no. You've got to make better progress than that. So, you've got to check fairly often. Some things you've got to check every day. Some things you've got to check at least by the end of the week. A salesman joins us, a little sales company. Supposed to make 10 calls first week. Wouldn't it be legitimate to call him in on Friday and say, John, what? How many calls? I mean, the stuff is simple. John says, well, sir, won't fit in this little box here. Well, now, John starts with a story. You say, John, I made this little box so small so a story won't fit. I don't need a story. I need what? A number. What will a number tell me? Everything. John's supposed to make 10 calls. What if he made 20? You say, wow, wow, we've got somebody. What if he only made one call? Will that tell us something about John's philosophy? And the answer is yes. Will it tell us something about his attitude? Of course. Will it tell us something about his disciplines? Of course. And if he wants a lesson in life change, all he has to do is be willing to face the numbers and come up with the results that will teach you to either celebrate if you've got good results or fix whatever needs to be fixed in your philosophy, attitude, activity, called disciplines. You don't need to go anywhere else. I do believe in affirmations, and they are valuable as long as you affirm the truth. It's said in ancient scripts that the truth will set you free. To do what? To amend your errors and pick up new disciplines. That's what the truth is for. To help us amend our errors and pick up the disciplines for life change. So, I do believe in affirming the truth. If you're broke, the best thing to affirm is, I am broke. Put that up on the refrigerator where you can see it every day. I mean, that's how you do that. It says, hey, something is wrong somewhere. I have messed up. And I'm telling you, if you'll start with that, it's called the process of life change. And it doesn't matter how small the process is to start. One discipline starts it, and then one discipline feeds another, feeds another. And the first thing you know, you've got this whole cycle in an upward, positive motion. It's called life change. It's called income change. It's called health change. Relationship with your family change. Equity is unprecedented, but you can have in numbers that will stagger the imagination. If you do not curse what's available and start amending what's possible to get the results that you want, I don't think I can put it in any better language. That's it. Kids can do it. Teenagers can do it. Parents can do it. Managers can do it. Government officials can do it. Anybody can do it. Anybody can do this stuff called personal change. Wow, results are the name of the game. Success is a numbers game. Good note to make. Success is a numbers game. You've got to go for the numbers. You've got to understand what the numbers are. I'm asking you to be mature enough to start checking your own numbers. How many books have you read in the last 90 days? Transform your life. Become cultured, powerful, sophisticated, healthy, influential, all the rest of the stuff you want. How many books? How many classes? How committed are you to taking what's available and turning it into equities unprecedented? Since we live in a country that there's been no such country in the last six and a half thousand years, if you'll pick up that process, ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you, it's called life change of the best order. Now, here's what's important about disciplines. All disciplines affect each other. In fact, here's a good philosophical phrase. Everything affects everything else. Nothing stands alone. To be naive in saying, well, this doesn't matter, I'm telling you, everything matters. There are some things that matter more than others, but there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Okay? We all pity the man who says, well, this is the only place I let down. Not true. The key is to take home. Every letdown affects the rest of your performance. Every letdown affects the rest. This is part of the educational process on personal development. If you don't take a walk around the block, you probably won't do the apple a day. If you don't do the apple a day, you probably won't consist, you know, start building your library. You don't build your library, you probably won't keep a journal, and you won't take pictures, and you won't do this. You won't do wise things with your money, won't do wise things with your time, won't do wise things with your possibilities and relationships. And the first thing you know, six years of that accumulated and we say, you have messed up. So, the whole key to reversing that process now is to start picking up these disciplines. Now, here's the positive side. Every new discipline affects the rest of your disciplines. 
Every new one affects the rest. That's why action is so important. The least action, the smallest action. Take it because when you start accomplishing and the value starts to return from that one action, it'll inspire you to do the next one and the next one and the next one. You start walking around the block. It'll inspire you to get an apple. Get an apple. It'll inspire you to get a book. Get a book. It'll inspire you to get a journal. Get a journal. It'll inspire you to grow, develop some skills. All disciplines affect each other. Every lack affects the rest. Every new affects the rest. The key is to diminish the lack and set up the new, and you've started a whole new life process. The key also, here's one more thought on discipline, is the greatest value of discipline. Self-worth, self-esteem. People are teaching self-esteem these days, but they don't connect it to disciplines. The least lack of discipline starts to erode our psyche. One of the greatest temptations is to just ease up a little bit. The slightest lack of doing your best starts to erode the psyche. Instead of doing your best, doing just a little less than your best. Sure enough, you say, well, it's just going to affect my sales. No, it's going to affect your consciousness. It's going to affect your philosophy. Now, you've begun, in the slightest way, to affect your own philosophy. Here's the problem with the least neglect. Neglect starts as an infection, and if you don't take care of it, it becomes a disease. And one neglect leads to another. And the worst of all, when neglect starts, it diminishes our self-worth, our self-confidence, our self-value. You say, well, how can I get back my self-respect? I'm telling you, you don't have to go to 29 classes. All you have to do is start the smallest discipline that now corresponds to your own philosophy. Like, I should and I could and I will. No longer will I let neglect stack up on me so that I will have the sorry scenario six years from now giving some excuse instead of celebrating my progress. And that's the key to discipline. Okay, let's get kids involved in the least of disciplines. One more and then one more and then another one and then another one and then some more. And the first thing you know, you're starting to weave the tapestry of a disciplined life into which you can pour more wisdom and more attitude and more strong feeling, more faith, more courage, your own commitment, your own desires, your own excitement. Invest it, invest it, invest it, invest it in discipline so that it's not wasted. The smallest of disciplines thereby transform your life. Join the 5%, join the 10%, join the 3%. Walk away from the 95%. Not live there anymore, because if you don't, the next six years of your life will be like the last six. Mr. Shaz said to me, Mr. Ron, six years now, you've been working. I'm telling you, the next six years of your life is going to be like the last six unless you take advantage and start making these personal changes. I made the changes, totally revolutionized my life. So, take a look at the next five years of your life. It's going to be like the last five and less and in less and in less and less you change. And if you will change, everything will change. Join the 5%. 10 years from now, the numbers are going to be the same. But I'm telling you, some faces in this audience can change and start showing up in the 3% crowd, in the 5% crowd, in the 10% crowd, and thereby dynamically affect your life and your future.